Our first scripture reading this morning is from Romans 12, verses 9 through 21. Hear now the word of the Lord. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Undo, outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will be heaping burning coals on their heads. Do not overcome evil by evil, but overcome evil with good. The second lesson, which is also the primary text for today's sermon, is in the book of Exodus, or rather in Genesis, chapter 18, beginning at 1. Hear the word of God. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd, took a calf, tender and good, gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh, yes, you did laugh. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Let us pray. Oh, prepare our hearts, O oh Lord, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that in hearing we may also obey your will, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? 
It's a rhetorical question, I suppose, but it seems one worth wrestling with and eventually answering. Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? Like many of you, I've been doing less driving and more walking these days with so many uh, meetings and trips and appointments canceled this spring, I find myself spending far less time in my car. Additionally, my days, while still rather full, don't feel nearly as hurried. It's been months since I've worn a watch because my schedule of appointments is not nearly as tight as it used to be. I find that most everything about the pace of my life has slowed down considerably. I was walking along a road recently that I normally drive when something caught my eye off to the left side and I was curious. So I stepped off the road into the shoulder, down the ditch and scrambled up a couple of yards of this slope to get a closer look. Although it was overgrown with some brush I could make out an old stone structure that had a heavy metal lid on top. After poking around for a while, I came to realize that it was an old well that was fed by a spring, still working, but now no longer in use, abandoned, presumably forgotten. Got back on the road, continued my walk wondering who had built that well, trying to imagine the livestock, the people that it served a long time ago. I've been driving that stretch of road for over two decades, almost every day, and I'd never seen it before. It's been there a long time, and yet it remains altogether, at least to me, invisible. There are things that have been with us for a long time, but we're only able to see them and to hear them when we slow down. Is it not true for us, at least most of us, that our lifestyles prior to COVID-19 were getting a little out of control? Not only were we driving on the left side of the freeway, but we were accelerating quickly, exceeding the speed limit, rushing from one thing to another, trying to get more work and play squeezed into our days. We may have done a lot, but because of the speed at which we were doing it, we missed a lot. And then came COVID, an invisible virus with the power to move global traffic from the left lane of the freeway all the way over to the right shoulder where we now creep along at the speed of a pedestrian, no longer driving or being driven. We now walk. Everything has slowed down almost to the point of whiplash. There are things that have been with us for a long time but we're only able to see them and to hear them when we slow down. That slower pace of life is one that Jesus seemed to favor. I find it really interesting as I look at the New Testament that the life of Jesus is depicted in movements that are never rushed. Even though he only had three years of an earthly ministry to accomplish his work as savior of the world, he was never in a hurry. I mean, once he took a slow ride on a donkey to the sounds of Hosanna, a few times, it appears, he went sailing with his friends. Mostly, however, he contented himself with walking. It's what the human body was designed to do. We were made for walking, it's the pace of our humanity. As it turns out, it may be the pace for our sanity. And because he was a walking man, Jesus noticed stuff along the way. And by stuff, I mostly mean people. He noticed blind beggars. He noticed lepers. 
He noticed long overlooked and in some cases detested women. He noticed children. He even noticed a little man once who was trying not to be noticed among the leaves of a sycamore tree. And once, or rather, and once he took notice of each of those people, he stopped what he was doing long enough to heal them, to befriend them, to dignify them. I mean, he really saw them. There are things that have been with us a long time, but we're only able to see them and to hear them when we slow down. George Floyd was hardly the first black neck to be met with a white knee. The history of the United States of America is full of such horrifying stories. And so why now? Why is it that our nation is in an uproar with people taking to the streets, protesting against the racism that has so thoroughly infected our country from its inception? Why now? I'm not sure I know the answer. But perhaps the world has slowed down enough to start taking notice. After all these many years of driving the same way, we may be seeing some things for the first time. And perhaps we are finally becoming attentive long enough to be horrified by what we see. It's gone on for too long. The outrage, the demands, the intolerance, the protests all say the same thing. This has to stop. We must put an end to racism. <clears throat> now, here's a caveat I feel like I need to insert right about now so that both you and I are clear about something. I'm not the spokesperson for this healing change that is now upon us. Because as I confessed to you last Sunday, I'm actually part of the problem. That leadership will come from the black, brown, and indigenous communities. The best I can do, I believe, is to encourage you to do what I am also trying to do, which is to listen to those voices. There is much that we've been overlooking because to really see it is really inconvenient and costly and uncomfortable. But I want to say that convenience and cost and comfort are not values that God holds dear. Now is the time to open our eyes and our ears to the reality of racism so that we can turn from it and so that we can turn more fully to the truth that in Christ we are all one. There's one flesh, one body. This, I believe, is a Kairos moment in world history. Do you know that word? It's a Greek word in the Greek, which is what our New Testament is originally written in, there are two words actually for how we translate the word time. There's chronos and kairos. Chronos is time that is marked by the wristwatch that I no longer wear, or the calendar that is now uncommonly free of engagements. And so um, in this moment right now, it's Sunday, June 14th, in the year of our Lord, 2020, at about 10.05 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. That's Kronos. Kairos is more like a season that has finally arrived. It's when the fruit in your orchards is ripe and ready for picking. It's when the baby is finished its time gestating in the womb and she's ready to enter the world. This is now a Kairos moment. And I want to make sure that those within earshot of my voice don't miss it. Don't mistake it for a mere fad or trend. Don't dismiss it as an issue for somebody else to pick up and take on and solve. I think you've heard me say this before or write it somewhere. 
that when it comes to this current global pandemic we are experiencing, we have specially trained health experts. And some of them are attending to the sick and others are working hard to develop vaccines to protect us from getting this disease. The rest of us, our smaller but no less important roles is mostly to keep our hands washed and to keep our faces covered in public and to maintain some physical distance from one another. But not with this. The infectious disease of racism is ours to eradicate. The time is now. And it's not enough to merely do no harm, to step back and create no more damage or to contribute to the problem. And it's not enough to simply click the like icon on an anti-racist statement that you find on social media. We all have something to do. We are all called to do something. It's Kairos time. Perhaps we can take a cue from our father and mother, this old couple, Abraham and Sarah. Abraham, the old story tells us, was met by God. I just love the way this story starts out. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre. Now, I'll just briefly acknowledge uh, with you what some of you probably already noticed, that the story includes three visitors who seem to represent God's presence, a detail that some people have found kind of confounding um, over the years. Uh, but I don't want to get into that right now. That's kind of the weeds of this story. I don't want to get there, go there, lest we miss the point. The point is that Abraham was met by God. And I'm just left to wonder why. Why Abraham? At the ripe old age of a hundred years, when he was just resting under the shade of an oak tree on a hot day, feet up, smoking his pipe, sipping his tea. And I'd like to suggest that perhaps that's precisely why he was met. What might look like idleness or even laziness to our eyes is what created the space for God to enter and appear to Abraham. Here's what I think I was given to say today, that this old country of ours, exhausted from its drivenness, has been given a forced Sabbath of sorts the planet and its population is now getting some much needed rest, even amid the chaos. It is here and now in our slowed down condition that we are, I believe, being met by the God of justice with a promise on his lips. Verse 9, I will surely return to you in due season, Kairos, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. Now, this promise, I want you to see, represented the deepest desires of Sarah's heart. She'd always wanted to be a mother, but she never could, and she was by now sure that she never would. Her body was, you could say, procreatively dead. And so she did what we all do. When we hear something that's too good to be true, she laughed it off. The dismissive laugh caught the attention of the spokesperson who said, why did Sarah laugh? Is anything too wonderful for God? Some translations render this word as hard. Is anything too hard for the Lord? The promise of God's coming kingdom with a new heaven and a new earth a world where justice rolls down like rivers and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream is not too good to be true. It's not too wonderful. And it's not too hard. However, it does require our participation. Notice that once Abraham was visited by God, he got to work. 
Five action words describe how he got busy. He started running around, getting a meal ready, ordering people to do the baking and the barbecuing, creating a feast for his guests. It's a hurried movement. The book of Ecclesiastes reminds us that there is a time for everything. Every matter under heaven has a time, a time to be born and a time to die, for example, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to keep silence and a time to speak up. While there is certainly a time to be quiet, this is now a time to speak up. While there is a time to go slow, Now is not that time. It's Kairos time. These are urgent days, and we can wait no longer. Like Abraham, we are realizing that we are being visited. Like Abraham, it is becoming clear that there is is important work to be done before the promise is fulfilled. The removal of racism, I believe, is the work that has been given to us in this season of the world's history. It's a Kairos moment. The time is now to complete the work that was left unfinished by previous generations. It's hard work. But because it's God's work, it's not too hard. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.